occurred to me that I would ever be in the position that I'm in now in the operatic world. I, it occurred to me that I was a damn good singer, I'm an excellent musician, I'm well trained. It's like someone who's been plumbing for, for 35 years of his life has to be a fairly decent plumber. Eleven years ago, when we first broadcast this profile, we suggested that 1975 was the year of Beverly Sills. She had made her long overdue debut at the Met. Her recordings, her concert tours, her television appearances had focused growing international attention on her. But then in 1979, she retired from the world of performing to become general director of the New York City Opera at Lincoln Center, where right now she's running the opera's busy summer season. I confess I know no one I admire more than Miss Sills. She is a warm and giving woman, and she is born with strength and tenderness, the difficulty of rearing two handicapped children, one severely retarded, one deaf. We thought that this summer, you might like to join us in taking another look at America's beloved Beverly. Silverman from Brooklyn, born to Russian immigrant parents, plugging away professionally since she was seven years old, until she became Beverly Sills, whom the critics have called the greatest singing actress in the world. Her appetite for work is stunning. Every morning when she's not on tour, she spends two and a half hours with her vocal coach and conductor, Roland Gagnon, in her Manhattan apartment, learning new roles. Many of her afternoons go like this, three-hour rehearsals. This one backstage at the New York City Opera before a performance of I Puritani. If there's a secret to her stamina, it may be that she manages to enjoy even the most grueling sessions by arriving so totally prepared that her work seems effortless. yourself no normally I don't also I'm terribly astigmatic so for all I know this eyelash I just put on could be a mustache <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really not very good at this after all these years in the theater and I've, I've been in the theater you know since I was seven which is 20 years ago you'd think I, <laughs> you'd think I would know how to put on an eyelash but I don't are you as good as you expected to be or are you perhaps even better than you expected to be I've never walked out totally satisfied with anything I've done. I've always been very irritated with, uh, I go home and I take the score and I put red marks over things that I felt I did badly and then, you know, we'll fix up the next time. And um, uh, the times that I have been satisfied have been so few and far between that I sometimes wonder, <laughs> you know, why do I keep going on? I'm never gonna get to the point that I want to get to.
We visited her last December at the only place she doesn't sing, Martha's Vineyard off Cape Cod, where she retreats with a man she's been married to since 1956, a wealthy Bostonian, Peter Greeno, a financial analyst who is decidedly not Mr. Beverly Sills. Her husband made her a gift of a home here two years ago. It burned to the ground just before they were to move in, so he built another. And they both agree they don't get here often enough. I love this house, and someday I think we will keep the New York apartment as a pied a terre and live here. Uh, that can't obviously be for the next five or six years, but after that I think we will reverse the mode of our lives. Then maybe you'll put a piano in here, because... No, <laughs> no I'm never going to put a piano in this place. Well, now wait. You mean you're going to quit singing in five or six years? Well, even if I don't quit singing, I always want this place to be my, my hideaway. I don't, if once I start putting the piano in and slapping my music down, then we have, we are just a duplicate of my existence in New York. Because you get no, absolutely no sense that this is Beverly Sills' home. There's nothing musical. Uh... No, and I like that. I, I really want this house to be something. You know, I'm a Gemini, and I think Geminis are schizophrenic. They really are split personalities. And uh, this is the split. <laughs> the New York apartment is very oriented towards my career in some way. All the, I, the costume designs are in the wall. You know, I always tease Peter that the little gallery when you come in is my shrine for his next wife to suffer in. <laughs> it's kind of like the lady who had a portrait done with all the jewels, and everybody said, but you don't own those jewels. And she said, I know, but the next wife is going to think I did. <laughs> So I, this house has to be separate and apart from, um, this is Mrs. Greeno's house. Her success came to her late. She was what they call a utility singer at the New York City Opera until she was 37. That was in 1966. <laughs> that year she sang her famous Julius Caesar, and she's been an international superstar ever since. What took you so long? Well, I was never in a hurry. For one thing, I'm basically not a terribly ambitious person. I want, oh, wait. I'm serious. I enjoy singing to the hilt and I enjoy being successful at it. Don't misunderstand. By nature, I like to do things well. It irritates me when I don't do things well. Uh, but you're not ambitious. But I'm not ambitious. I, it never occurred to me that I would ever be in the position that I'm in now in the operatic world. I, it occurred to me that I was a damn good singer. I'm an excellent musician. I'm well-trained. It's like someone who's been plumbing for, for 35 years of his life. It has to be a fairly decent plumber. Look, you have a schedule from September until May, which I have seen, which would break the back of a Valkyrie. Now, what in the world do you do that for? Oh, well, for one thing, I, I, I think I am a workaholic. I always have been. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're my absolute idol. Thank you. This is a real treat for us. It is a very lonely life. It's very glamorous to a point. Lots of parties and lots of attention is paid to you. And I just think you're the greatest. Well, when the party, when the party's over, you're by yourself.
apparently you suffer no stage fright. You go through no temper tantrums. You make it look so easy, Beverly. It is. It really is. I, it's because I enjoy it. If it, it. It's only... The only difficult things in life to do are things you don't enjoy doing. But you just think back on your own life. Any, anything you enjoy is very easy to do. Yeah, but some of us find it a little more difficult to enjoy a thing. You seem to enjoy everything. You, you enjoy your family. You enjoy your problems. You enjoy <laughs> singing. <laughs> I think that's true. I love to worry. <laughs> I have the best time when I can worry. But yeah, I think it was, is it you or your mother who said that Beverly's not a happy woman, she's a cheerful woman. And there is a difference. Yeah. That's true. A happy woman is someone who has no cares at all. A cheerful woman is someone who has lots of cares but learns to laugh in spite of them. So that's what I think is the very important difference. But uh, cheerful I am. Face it, Beverly, you've had a darn tough time. A deaf child, a retarded child. This house, which was which was built, burned to the ground. Two days before we went to move in. Cancer I mean, operation. Cancer. It's all very cheerful. Um, however, we <laughs> we had some great peaks. I mean, we also have had some lovely things happen to us. I I do believe, and I know Peter laughs at me when I say this. I I think there's some kind of vendetta against me up in heaven, and it's a question with me that I'm not going to be licked. That's all. <laughs> I think some people do go through life marked. I think certainly the Kennedy family has a mark on them, and I probably do too. I don't know, um, I, I'm not in any way inferring that I believe in some supernatural. Yeah. I don't. I think that there are certain lives that run a, a particular course that have tremendous peaks. You just can't peak any higher. And certainly Peter and I have had that. But then they have such tremendous lows that you simply can't get any, any more dismal low. And we've had both of them. But I think there is um, something in me that I, I just, I can't stand to admit defeat. Um, it, it's just a way of life with me. So I, I think we, Peter and I will just go on taking what comes. Naturally, there is no alternative. And your mother says that when Beverly goes on stage, all her worries are behind her. Is there some of that? Well, yes, what it is, it's an escape. my singing is very therapeutic and for three hours I can be a different lady who doesn't have all these peaks and veils it's just a, a lady I know how the story comes out <laughs> I know the ending even if it's not a happy one you see I know that when the curtain goes down I'm gonna get up off the floor again in real life sometimes I wonder but uh, when they bury me everything will have stopped moving but the vocal cords will still be quivering <laughs> still fighting <laughs>